Yeah, I think we're all set. Okay, so last class we did Esther, and with Esther we finished off the historical books. Okay, so um, now we would be moving into the poetic books, which are also called the wisdom books, uh, and there are five of them in number. So we will very briefly look at uh, an introduction of these five poetic books. Uh, different people look at these five books in different ways. Uh, but uh, I liked one scholar who said that in these five books, we see people, man, reaching out to God. If you look in the rest of the Old Testament, it is God reaching out to man, either with instructions or with uh, words of comfort or words of judgment. It's God reaching out to man in the rest of the Old Testament. But in these five books of the uh, of the, these poetic books, we see humans reaching out to God in different uh, contexts, in different circumstances, and I think this makes sense because in the book of Job, we see a human reaching out to God in his pain and suffering. He does not know why he is going through what he is, and he is hoping for relief from God. He is also hoping that God would give him answers as to why he is facing all of these uh, situations. In the book of Psalms, in the same way, we see the psalmists, the writers, reaching out to God with different emotions. They pour out their heart in praise and worship. But not just that, they also pour out their heart in anger, in doubt, in uh, you know, with their, with their pain and suffering. You see them reaching out to God with all of their emotions. And um, in Proverbs, we see a writer reaching out to God in the sense he's trying to understand what is the meaning of this life? Why am I alive and what am I achieving You know, by all the hard work that I'm doing under the sun? So this too is a kind of reaching out. Then we have, um, um, what did I say? Proverbs or did I say Ecclesiastes? So sorry, I meant Ecclesiastes. Book of Proverbs is people reaching out to God asking for wisdom because they want to know how to handle the different situations of life. Uh, so, And uh, the Song of Solomon, uh, for the Israelite people, uh, they saw this book as an expression of the Israelite nation reaching out to God because they considered God their Lord and their husband. Why? Because um, uh, in the time of the original Passover in Egypt, when God passed over, uh, the doors which had been you know covered with blood he entered into a blood covenant with them promising to shield them protect them and be their lord be their husband and you, you find in many of the prophetic books you actually see this picture where god describes himself as the husband of the nation of israel so which is why every feast passover feast the people would read out the song of solomon they would stand in the temple and read out the entire book as a reminder to them that now they are in a covenant relationship with Yahweh and he, is, uh, he has chosen to be related to them and take responsibility for them. So in all of these five poetic books, we see humans reaching out to God in different contexts and they are dealing with some very basic human experiences. They are dealing over there with suffering and pain. Um, there are acts of worship, uh, acts of expressing anger. You have uh, people reaching out, seeking wisdom, guidance. You have um, people seeking out for the very meaning of life. And of course, also uh, we have expressions of love in the Song of Solomon. So these are all very basic human experiences that are being uh, dealt with in these five poetic books. Now, there are basically three kinds of Hebrew poetry. And this, I think, is mentioned in your uh, textbook, if I remember. Uh, so you have uh, musical poetry, which is basically people composing um, you know, lyrics, which can be sung in the form of a song. So you have musical poetry. And a lot of psalms are in this category, where you can actually sing out these uh, poetic works. Then there's, of course, dramatic uh, poetry, where you have um, dialogue. 
which would be uh, you know uh, job and song of solomon where you have a story being narrated but a lot of poetic uh, writing is done you know in the passages even though a drama is being described it's being described in, in, in with uh, using a lot of poetic language so um, this dramatic poetry and there's something called didactic uh, poetry didactic is just a word which means teaching so you have poetry which is focused on trying to teach something so proverbs and ecclesiastes would fall into this category where you have teaching being conveyed using poetic form so you have musical poetry dramatic poetry and didactic poetry in um, you know in these five poetic books of the old testament now one very basic thing that we need to understand about hebrew poetry is that it is in no way similar to english poetry now if you are familiar with english poetry and you have to grow up with it in school whatever you understand as poetry will be very different from what the hebrew people back then thought of as poetry because when we come to english poetry it, it seems to be more about rhyme and rhythm at least traditional poetry now of course poetry has advanced and now they don't really follow those old ancient uh, rules any longer but generally traditionally english poetry is all about rhyme and rhythm so at least the last portions of each sentence uh, would have to um, would have to rhyme for instance you have twinkle twinkle little star how i wonder uh, what you are so star and r are uh, rhyming together then you would have up above the world so high like a diamond in the sky so high and sky are rhyming and it's very very important in traditional english poetry the last words rhyme and so there's a kind of rhythm you can almost sing it out you have jack and jill going up the hill and uh, what happens after that i wrote it uh, to fetch a pail of water jack fell down broke his down and jill came tumbling after so you have water after kind of um, you know rhyming and of course you have jill hill down crown it's all about rhyme and rhythm the hebrews did not think of poetry that way at all um, they thought of two parallel thoughts so they would have one sentence and then they would come up with another sentence which is connected to the first sentence so you have two parallel sentences two parallel phrase phrases trying to convey uh, one idea or maybe one contrast or there's some connection between those two phrases so for they are not thinking at all in terms of rhyme and rhythm they are thinking about presenting two sentences which will have some interesting connection between them so when you are looking at hebrew poetry you always try to see how are the sentences connected you will have one set of sentences which will be trying to convey either a contrast or a similar idea and um, uh, it's called parallelism and your textbook has got examples of different kinds of parallelism which are used in our hebrew poetry yes go ahead yeah you have a question exactly so you thinking more in terms of thought what is being conveyed rather than just rhyme and rhythm so yes it's true that it, traditional english poetry was all about that but now we are you have a lot of variety in the because of all the other cultures which have come in and influenced english poetry so yes it's very very true yeah. how do you mean the mess is the message saying uh, where which no just elaborate the question a little bit the english translators when they were translating the hebrew poetry they did try to bring out the meaning uh, as exactly as they could but sometimes the imagery which are which is being used would have been better understood by the hebrew people rather than us today and we may not really understand the imagery very very clearly for instance the hebrew poet would very very confidently say god you are my rock and uh, here we are in modern day and we're thinking of one big you know chunk of rock and we're thinking in, in what does god look like a rock so for them I, uh, some of the imagery would have made more sense 
but the english translator has tried to stay very sincere and very exact in doing the translation uh, so sometimes they they change the wording a little bit to make the meaning a little more clear maybe in niv and um, you know other versions like that nkjv will not even do it it will just stick to the original translation whether you understand it or not they would prefer to just stick to the original wording niv tries to make it a little more um, easy for the readers to understand and so sometimes it adds an extra word or two just to bring out the meaning uh, so you have all of these variations in our english translations but yeah they are really trying to stay as accurate as possible um, so yeah that is just uh, for us to know a little bit about um hebrew poetry so one example that uh, we can a couple of examples maybe uh, if we could have one person read out proverbs chapter 1 verse 8 and then we can see what two parallel thoughts are being presented over there proverbs 1 8 if someone could read out Okay, so uh, something is being said in the first portion. You know, pay attention to your father's instruction, and the same thing is being uh, repeated in the second phase. But you know, it's being put in a slightly different manner. Uh, do not forsake your mother's teaching. So this would be, in fact, be a synonymous parallelism, where both the sentences are trying to convey the same thing. But then, in some proverbs, will have. two contrasting sentences the first sentence is talking about the what the wise man does and the second sentence will talk about what the foolish man does where there is a kind of contrast so these are all the parallelisms which happen in hebrew poetry um taking an example maybe from ecclesiastes if we could have a person read out ecclesiastes 1 verse 4 ecclesiastes 1 4 here we see a contrast in the first phrase it's talking about you know how one generation of people is born they die another generation comes so generations come and go this constant change nobody stays alive forever generations come generations go the culture changes but look at the second sentence the earth it stays stable forever and ever through the ages so there's a contrast being um, presented between the first sentence and the second sentence so hebrew poetry is all about parallelism where you have a kind of contrast or a similarity or a very original thought being conveyed using two two sentences and some places it's more than two sentences you would have a, a, a maybe a small section of sentences uh, you know especially in dramatic poetry uh, which would be job uh, and song of solomon so these are some of the kinds of poetry that we see so coming now to the book of job which is the first poetic book which we see um it's li like i said the we would call it dramatic poetry uh, so it's not exactly in the form of a poem there is a lot of narrative given but there are many many large sections where poetic language is used to convey the discussions so the key personalities as we know job and his three friends how many friends did job have technically speaking if anyone has actually counted the number of friends who are mentioned in the book of job are three of them mentioned or are four of them mentioned so there are three of them and they do a lot of talking and then and a fourth person speaks up and he says you know i kept quiet because you are all you're all elder than me and i wanted you to have your say but i do want to say something and he speaks up so in a way you have one more person present over there who is also a friend okay so you can be very of course very technical about it and say yes he had only three friends but that fourth guy was not an enemy he was a friend sort of so of the four people who have come to ask about his well being and sit with him and grieve with him because as part of their culture when someone is grieving you show your respect and concern for that person by coming and being with them for a number of days you know um to sit with them and share in their pain uh, only thing of course here in this story we see that rather than being a comfort they become a um, an actual pain to him adding to his pain rather than helping him 
uh, yeah, you were about to ask a question. No. Is it always more? We cannot say that Hebrew poetry is always more profound than English poetry. It all depends on the person who's expressing his thoughts. There are some who are able to put their thoughts in a very, they can put a very great big idea in the simplest of terms. And you know, just using a small bunch of phrases, they can bring out in a great, amazing truth. That would just depend on the ability of the writer. So there's no competition at all between English writers and Hebrew writers and biblical writers. Um, of course, the biblical writers had the assistance of the Holy Spirit, so they did have an advantage. But it would be a very wrong statement to say that only the biblical Hebrew poetry is profound and today people cannot come up with something equally beautiful. It's just that this is not maybe you know inspired by the Holy Spirit as the word, written word of God. Whatever efforts are being made now are just means of communication that people are using. Yeah, so. OK, um, where was I? Yes, the, the date of the Book of Job. So it's generally said that the Book of Job was written during the patriarchal period. If you're not familiar with that term, it is a term that you would need to know. The patriarchs were the fathers. The word patriarch literally means father. So the patriarchs were basically your Abraham and uh, Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. They are the patriarchs. So it is generally believed that this book of Job, uh, the events which took place, took place during that time, during the time of the uh, patriarchs. So it's a very, very old book, a very old story, uh, you know, which happened around the time of the Genesis events. Uh, so why do people say that? They say that because uh, just like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they all were serving as priests of their family. They would offer sacrifices on behalf of their family. Even this Job also regularly used to offer sacrifices for his family members. Why? Because at that time, the tabernacle had not yet been set up. The priests had not yet been appointed. This was a very early period when all these things had not yet come into existence. So. There was no mosaic law at that time. There was no tabernacle. Also, we see that Job's wealth is described as this many donkeys, this many camels. There's not really much mention of gold or silver. So in those patriarchal times, your wealth was mainly your cattle and your land. Very rarely was it in the form of precious metals. That came later. So um, also, they, uh, the, the name for God which is used, uh, here in the book of Job is mainly El Shaddai. And that is a uh, name which is very, very common in your book of Genesis, where mainly the, the name El Shaddai is used again and again to describe God. Uh, later on, Yahweh became more common. But here in the very beginning, it was El Shaddai. It's not Yahweh because Yahweh is uh, something that gains prominence after you know God speaks to Moses and says, this is who I am. So uh, that name comes later. Um, also, they talk about how Job had a very lengthy lifespan. How old was the man when he finally died? Job chapter 42, verse 16. What was his age when he finally? And people generally did not live one and a half centuries Okay, later on. So it was only during the patriarchal times that lifespans were that lengthy. So that is another thing. And then there's something that some people say. They talk, they look, they look at Genesis chapter 36, verses 10 and 11, and they make an interesting statement. Now, nobody knows whether this is true or not. At least that's the view which some people hold. If someone could read out Genesis chapter 36, verses 10 and 11. Mm. Okay, so they say that this friend of Job, Eliphaz the Themanite, 
might have been a descendant of Esau. So maybe, you know, great, great grandson or whatever, but somewhere in the close in the lineage to the beginning. So it's what they say. He might have been a descendant. So he might have been a great, great grandson or whatever. So all of these um, seem to indicate that the events of Job's life took place a very, very long time ago during the patriarchal period. Now, um, we cannot dismiss the book of Job as just a story, as a fairy tale, because other Bible writers, they talk about him as if he is a historical real person who lived in history. Uh, we have Ezekiel who talks about him in chapter 14, Ezekiel 14, verses 14 and 20, where he refers to Job as an actual person who lived. Also, James in chapter 5, verses 10 and 11, he talks about Job as if he is a real person who lived. Okay, so we cannot dismiss this book as a fairy tale. These are events which actually took place. Um, and where did the story happen? It happened somewhere outside the boundaries of the Israelite territory because it takes place in the land of Uz, which would be somewhere in Northern Arabia, not particularly sure where. Um, coming to the structure of the book of Job, um, in chapters 1 to 2, we basically see that Satan makes an allegation. That's basically how the entire story begins. What is the allegation that Satan is making? He says, God, people are worshipping you only because of the benefits they can get from you. You take away all the benefits, then they'll not be interested in worshipping you anymore because you are not worthy of worship. So that's the main allegation that he's making. God is not really worthy of worship. If he does nice things to you, he's earning the right to be worshipped. And so, okay, fine, you worship him. But what is God's assertion? He says that he is Lord God and he is, he has a character which is indeed worthy of worship and adoration. And so God says, even if I withdraw all things from this particular man, he will continue to honor me because he recognizes who I am and what I am, that I am worthy of worship even though all the benefits have been withdrawn. So, um, that, uh, so that is basically how the story begins. And Satan asks for permission to remove the benefits so that you know we, they can all observe Job and see whether he is continuing to honor God or not. So that would be in chapters 1 to 3. Then in chapters 4 to 37, you have, the, you have three rounds of discussions which take place where all the friends, they make the main allegation that you must have done something sinful and that is the reason why you are suffering. God does not allow good people to suffer. Only if you have done something evil, something sinful, only then will God allow suffering to take place is the doctrine which the friends had. And so they keep repeating that uh, again and again. Um, and then you have the fourth person who finally speaks up, Elihu. And he says, I think God is making you suffer because he wants to humble you. He wants to correct you. I think you have too much pride in you. And that's the reason why God is trying to humble you by, by making you suffer. So these are all the discussions uh, which take place in chapters 4 to 37. And then in chapters 38 to 42 is where God finally speaks to Job directly. And um, uh, at the end of it, Job, you know, he, he says, I repent. And after Job repents, then God blesses uh, Job with twice the amount which he had before. Okay, so we'll have to look at what is it that Job repents of and, you know, some of those details. Uh, but, you know, some other preliminary, um, you know, informations that need to be conveyed. Um, in chapters 1 and 2, we see that God, uh, that Job very clearly says, you know, I will not uh, dishonor God, uh, you know, whatever happens. And so he holds on to his trust in God. And then in chapters 3 to 31, we see him getting more and more desperate. And he says, Lord, you're not explaining to me why. Why are you doing this? I have been good and you know that you are God. So you know exactly what I've been doing. You know that I've been good. 
these people are saying that i've done something sinful but you know the truth so why why are you not coming through for me and at one point he goes to the extent of saying oh i wish i could have a mediator someone who can stand between god and me and explain because god is not talking to me he's not answering me and i wish i could someone could do a mediating intercessory job for me so that at least i can get my case across because i am genuinely innocent so there's a lot of grumbling and mumbling which goes on uh, from the side of job in in chapters 3 to 31 and it's all mainly because of the pain that he is going through and he feels that god should give him an explanation um then of course in uh, um chapter 42 Uh, verses one to six, he repents of his attitude, and finally, in the end, uh, he is restored. That would be in chapter forty-two, verses seven to seventeen. Uh, uh, so, um, so yeah, the two main things which uh, uh, you know people emphasize from this book of Job, uh, they talk about uh, chapter nineteen, verses twenty-five to twenty-seven. where he talks about how god will redeem him and restore him so uh, there's an emphasis on god the redeemer that is in chapter 19 verses 25 to 27 and also where he cries out for a mediator he says i wish i could have a mediator that would be in chapter 9 33 25 4 and also 33 23 okay these are just references which you can note down um So finally, when Job is restored, uh, we see that he gets a double the number of sheep which he had earlier, the double the number of camels that he had earlier. But he is given only ten children. Earlier he had ten. Now again he is given only ten. Uh, that's because he already has another ten sitting in heaven. So you know now he has double the children. It's just that uh, very sadly, uh, due to Satan's interference, ten of them are in heaven. Okay. So um, now let's come to the actual the the. the meat of this book what happened why did it happen uh, yes so uh, the the question raised was that were the people were the children of uh, job godly at all because he had to make sacrifices for them um the thing about human beings is that they all need to make sacrifices uh, moses used to make sacrifices on his own behalf and on behalf of the others because he too used to commit sins uh, and um, so all the children of israel had to make sacrifices because none of them were as perfect as jesus in the same way job's children also were making uh, sinful decisions for which sacrifices had to be made so uh, we cannot say that job's children were extra rotten not necessarily in the same way that their sins had to be atoned for all the other people's sins also had to be atoned for uh, so it does not imply anywhere in that passage that they were extra evil or extra sinful uh, but job took the care to be a good priest and do those sacrifices on a regular basis he was not a casual parent to said ah, it's all right god will just take care no he had the response sense of responsibility to offer regular sacrifices on their behalf and later on we see the she the high priest also doing that for the people of israel where he would regularly every morning and every evening a sacrifice was offered that is the level of our imperfection where a sacrifice has to be done every morning and every evening for year after year uh, so that god can continue to accept the people so uh, job's children were not uh, especially evil or anything they were sinning in the same with the rest of the human race sins um okay so yeah coming back to the book of uh, job and what exactly is it about um we see that in chapter 9 verses 21 to 24 you know there's something that job says okay so we are looking at the very main things in the book of job so that we'll have a clearer picture of this book okay so if you can turn to your job chapter 9 verses 21 to 24 this is an observation which job makes okay why am i emphasizing these particular verses uh god when he speaks up 
he makes two speeches in the two speeches he touches upon certain specific things which job talked about okay so god does not give an explanation of why he suffered why he went through that whole painful thing god does not even bother giving an explanation rather in the two speeches which god makes he touches upon certain things which job said because for god it was very important to clarify those particular points because those particular points are connected to the character of god job raised an issue the friends raised an issue regarding the character of god and in the book of job god clarifies this is who i am he does not offer an explanation of why the poor man went through the suffering that is something that would have been explained to him later when he went to heaven but here while he was on the earth uh, no explanation is given and in the book of job clarification is given directly from a voice from heaven where god clarifies this is who i am and this is the way i do things okay so just touching upon those main passages to which god gives a reply so job chapter 9 verses 21 to 24 if someone could very quickly read out please Okay, so Job is desperate. He is in a very, very bad condition, and God is not giving him deliverance. And so he says, "My goodness, it looks like as if God distrusts both the blameless and the wicked, because Job, in his heart, he knows that he's been regularly giving the sacrifices. So in that sense, he is blameless. It doesn't mean that he has not sinned at all, but regularly he's been offering sacrifices and seeking, you know, forgiveness for him and his family. So he says." uh uh it almost looks as if both the blameless and the wicked get destroyed and he say, he goes on to say in uh, verse 23 he says uh, you know he mocks the despair of the innocent sure i am innocent and i'm suffering and it's like as if god is just sitting over there mocking me and then he goes on to say in verse 24 it's almost as if god you know blindfolds the judges so that they can do whatever they want is wickedness happening and god is not taking any action against the wicked uh, so this is something which job says uh, regarding the character of god um, what he is trying to convey is that unlike all these wicked people who have been doing evil things i have made every effort to live correctly to live blamelessly so why am i being given the same treatment that the other people were, are being given it's not right it doesn't seem correct i should be getting special treatment but that is not happening so you see that is the point which he is trying to make over here um and um we also see other old testament writers in other books of the old testament who have said something similar okay so it's not only job who has raised this issue if you look in psalm 66 Verses 18 to 20, which we will not read out. Uh, but then, if you go to go, you know, just quickly to your Bible, Psalm 66, 18 to 20. David is speaking over there, and he says, um, "If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and has heard my prayer." so david believes that god has heard him god has answered him because he is doing good because he is living right okay so in his heart david firmly believes if i do good i should be blessed i should be rewarded if i do evil then i should be punished uh, habakkuk 1:13 habakkuk raises the question he says your eyes are too pure to look on evil you cannot tolerate wrong doing why then do you tolerate the treacherous uh, uh, um, yeah the treacherous why are you silent when the while the wicked swallow up those more righteous so these are all questions which have been asked by other people also so job is saying i have tried so hard to live right and for some reason god is giving me the same treatment that he gives the wicked in fact the wicked are better off because he's not punishing them they are flourishing and here i am a good person 
who did right and look at the suffering that i am undergoing okay so it's a question which he raises up and this is god's answer in his first speech god yahweh makes two speeches right in the first speech this is uh, what um, the lord uh, says uh, you know just to sum up the entire thing because it's a very lengthy passage speech 1 basically god talks about the different acts of creation you know um uh, he he says um you know do you know how how the the snow has been uh, stored you know do you know how the rain is created he talks about all these different acts of creation and basically he's trying to say look at the great skill with which i have designed everything in creation so i who have used such skill and such great wisdom to make all of these things if you can't understand even these basic things who are you to question my skill with regard to what i do with humans with both the righteous and the wicked when you cannot understand the things which you can see and touch and explain them how can you start explaining the things which i have in my mind the plans which i have for the righteous and for the wicked okay so that's basically the point that god makes so he god seems to be saying don't question my designing and my planning it is beyond your understanding simple human things which are there on the earth you are unable to understand things which are you know decided in the spiritual realm regarding the future regarding eternity regarding humans and how they should be rewarded and judged those matters go beyond just this physical phenomena if you cannot even understand the physical phenomena how can you understand these greater things okay is the main point which uh, god makes in his first speech coming to the second speech okay in the second speech um he talks about two main um, creatures the behemoth and the leviathan he talks about these two creatures and he says are you powerful enough to control them are you powerful enough to make them do what you want done indirectly god is saying i know how to deal with the wicked and i will do it in my time you who cannot even handle human creatures which are roaming around on the face of the earth uh, what can you say about uh, you know how i choose to control and manipulate and use the great powers which exist you know the humans the rulers the ones who think that they are all powerful so god uses uh, in the second speech he uses the example of the behemoth and the leviathan to say in the same way i can control these creatures and make them do whatever i want in the same way i control the powerful and the wicked and the violent and i know what to do with them okay so god does not even answer job about why the suffering has taken place rather god talks about his character now um in the end we see a little you know uh, people can tend to be puzzled about this last portion where uh, god criticizes the friends and he says what they have said is very very wrong and then god says to job what job has said is correct but at the same time job god scolds job and says why are you speaking without you know any wisdom so what exactly is going on over here god says the friends are wrong god says job is correct but god also scolds job and says you're speaking nonsense without understanding you know without without understanding without wisdom you are speaking so what exactly is being conveyed over here um the main thing which job goes on saying throughout you know if you want, if you if you have to sum up all the long speeches of job the main thing which he is saying is i am good i have done good but god is punishing me god should only reward me okay basic summary of what job is saying friends what are they saying again and again they go and say um, god blesses the good god always blesses the good he never punishes the good you are something bad is happening to you so conclusion you must have sinned in some way so you have these two parties making these two main assumptions and god is saying uh, what the friends are saying about me is wrong i never said that i will only give good things to people who are following me because i have a mind which goes beyond human understanding and i have my own plans you know of how to uh, work out events in history 
because we see it happening even in the life of Jesus. Jesus, the one perfect person who never sinned, who did everything right, God allows evil to play a very strong, powerful role in his life. Why? Because God was helpless? Because God had forsaken Jesus? No, but because God's wisdom is so great. And that's what Paul you know, talks about in, the, in, the, in his epistles. He says, the wisdom of God is so great that Satan did not catch what was going to happen. He could not understand what God had planned because the wisdom of God was that great. So um, over here, God is saying to the friends, what you have said about me is wrong. I have never ever said that I will only do good to the people who are following me. And I, uh, God says, I will even allow suffering because I have a higher plan. And in fact, we see that higher plan very clearly demonstrated in the life of the Messiah. He's called the suffering servant. He underwent more suffering than you know most people have ever gone through. But what an amazing result came out of that. The redemption of entire mankind. So God says, I am following a higher level of thinking which humans cannot understand. All you can do is stand back, look at what I'm doing. And as you begin to understand it, stand and worship me and adore me. That's all. You cannot understand it all at your level. Okay. It's, uh, uh, so God judges the um, friends for making a wrong accusation. In what way was Job correct in his speech? He was correct in the sense he genuinely had not done any you know, terrible great sin which he was refusing to con confess and repent of. There were no um, unconfessed sins in his life. He was regularly repenting of all his undoing or, or, or all his wrongdoings and he was in a right relationship with God. So uh, Job was correct and the friends were wrong. And what did Job have to repent of? Job had to repent of the fact that he was demanding an explanation and saying, what kind of a God is this? He's treating me the same way he's treating the wicked. And God said, there are things which you don't understand. You're asking for explanations which you do not have the right to ask for because in your limited understanding, you cannot even understand creation. Where will you understand bigger things? So the end at the end of the book, it is just left like that. God never actually explains why he sometimes uses evil, why he uses suffering sometimes to bring out good. It's not something that has been fully explained even today. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God. But why does God use bad things sometimes? Why does he permit and allow some of those bad things uh, you know, um, to achieve his purposes? He does not give a full explanation uh, even today, even now. But even as we see how he works out the good and the evil in his greater plan to bring out something beautiful, every time we see that, we just have to stand and begin to grasp what he's doing and worship him and acknowledge and say, yes, Lord, your plans are indeed great and marvelous. So Book of Job is all about submission. It's all about admitting that, yes, I am human. And scientists who consider themselves so great and who think they have already understood all the things they are to understand have still not understood how the basic human brain really works. Why do human beings dream? Why are dreams so essential to, to human you know, um, you know, understanding and to, to keep a human being sane? Because without dreams, people would actually go mad. Basic things of life, scientists have not understood. So humans are still in the process of trying to discover all that God has planned for humanity. And so Job, book of Job says, just submit to him, trust in him. And when the time comes, God will take care of his own. He will watch out for them. He will fulfill his plans for them. And he will fulfill his plans for all of mankind and humanity. All right. So those are some of the main things which are brought out in the book of Job. We could not go through the actual verses and the actual passages because that would take too much time. But, you know, generally when the book of Job is taught as a separate book, uh, it kind of goes over three months where uh, each passage is clearly discussed. 
and these basic truths which I have talked about, they are brought out in greater detail, in greater clarity. But this was just like a kind of summing up for you to kind of have an overall idea of what this particular book talks about. So now in the last two minutes that we have, if anyone has any deep, profound question, yes. Wow. You know, if my English teacher could hear you, she would say, you need to enunciate. Open your mouth and bring out the words. Patriarchs are the uh, Abraham, Isaac, uh, Jacob, and Joseph. They are the, called the patriarchs, the fathers of the nation. So the period during which they lived is called the patriarchal period. If you're asking for exact dates, go to a scholar. I have no idea. <laughs> so that's just the patriarchal period. So these events took place sometime during that time when those people were living. So it's a very ancient old story is what they are trying to say. Yeah. Yeah, it's what I had read somewhere. I don't remember the... Okay, the question asked over here is what is the duration of this entire story of Job? How many months did it extend over? Uh, yes, it extended sometime over a period of three or four months. It did not happen in one week. Okay, so um, Job did not become all discouraged and go to the extent of grumbling and mumbling in a matter of one week. It took time. The man had nothing to look forward to in that time. A God is silent, complete silence. And it's amazing. Um, this, um, okay, there's the bell. Fine, let's leave it. Okay, let's just close with a word of prayer. Uh, yeah. Uh, Lord, we just thank you so much for this class that we could have. Uh, thank you a lot for some of the things that we could see in this book of Job. Um, what was true for Job, O oh Lord, is true even for us today. Even today, we still do not understand many things, uh, many things that you permit to happen to us. Uh, but Lord, we know, we now know because of the Bible, because of all the stories of these people, that we can trust you. We may not know the why and the how and the details and the when and uh, when the relief will come and all of that. But after having read all of these stories, at least we know now, oh Lord, very clearly that you will come through for us. You will always be faithful to your people. You will never put us to shame when we place our trust in you. So I thank you, oh Lord, that we can have this wonderful hope. And Lord, I pray that we would be like this man, Job. Um, who had led such a godly life that even when everyone was making allegations and saying, no, no, you must have done some sin, he could look into his heart and clearly see that he had really tried his best to honor you. What an amazing man, O oh Lord. Help us, O oh Lord, to be at that level where we have such a walk with you, where we are really making such a concentrated effort to honor you in every single decision of our lives. That, Lord, even when someone lifts a finger, we can clearly say, no, I have genuinely stood for the Lord. Thank you, O oh Lord, that you are a forgiving God and that um, when we fall, you forgive us and you treat us as though we are blameless. You no longer remember those sins. But once we have repented, once we have confessed, you just regard us as being blameless in your eyes. Thank you, O oh Lord, for your great love and compassion towards us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much.